Today's Holy Gospel comes to us from John 15. On the night of his arrest, Jesus taught his disciples about the relationship they would have with him. Those who abide in his word and love bear fruit. Apart from him, they can do nothing. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I will bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So, have you ever been lost? Like, like really lost? We live in this era of cell phones and GPS devices, where getting lost is becoming a thing of the past. My beautiful, gorgeous, talented, brilliant, amazing wife was the victim of being lost quite often before we purchased a GPS for the car. You see, she is dyslexic, and a side effect of that is that rights and lefts don't exist in your brain. Yes, she gave me permission to share this, and yes, she has wound up in the wrong state before. So before GPS she would frequently get super turned around and need to call for help. It's not, it's not fun for her. It can actually be terrifying. I would receive a, a phone call and be given a, a crossed street to try to triangulate her position and get her back to familiar territory. You see, once she has a route to and from a place, she has to stick to it or she will find herself in, in no man's land and have to be guided back home to home base. When we first moved to our new house in Round Lake, getting lost became a new norm because every path was a new one. I would get home from work and on many occasions, my daughter, Enna, would run up to me and announce energetically, mommy took a new way home today, while my wife sheepishly grinned. Now. I, on the other hand, hardly ever get lost. Uh, I seem to have this odd internal compass that guides me over the landscape. I create mental maps in my head over where things are in relation to other things. I, on purpose, take new routes for fun to and from places just to kind of expand my mental map of the landscape. You honestly could probably spin me around a couple of times and I would know where north is depending on the time of day and where the sun is at. I can tell you what direction we are headed. I'm not kidding. I hardly ever get lost. And on the rare occasion I do, it's more exciting, not terrifying, because I know soon enough I will find my way. But there was a time in my life where I was truly lost. It had nothing to do with directions, streets, or roads, but it had everything to do with my place in the world. I was a struggling high school teenager trying to figure out my identity and place in the world. And at the time, my stepfather and I were constantly butting heads and couldn't seem to agree on anything. So I did my best to, to avoid being home. I worked an after-school job, played in multiple bands, hung out at my friends' houses as much as possible. It was in, this, in the midst of this lostness that I encountered God. A couple of friends invited me to church, and after much persuading, I came to their youth group. And immediately, it felt like something was different in this place. From the get-go, people seemed genuinely interested in me. 
and for the first time in a long time, I felt comfortable. After attending for a bit, I began to hear about Jesus and how I was a part of this heavenly family. And for a guy who was adrift, this sounded like the home I had been looking for, something far different than what I had been experiencing. After a year of this newfound church home, tendrils of doubt began to weave into my new faith. I did my best to ignore them, well, because they were messing with my newfound sense of home. I couldn't lose this home. It was it really felt like all I had. I began to feel adrift in a familiar place again. Odd how that can happen. And then, then I met Donald. Donald was a MDiv, Masters of Divinity student, and be, had become my small group leader at church. After a while, I admitted, I acknowledged somewhat reluctantly that I had began doubting my faith. And I told him about these places of lostness and darkness, where I was sure my new faith had kind of just washed away. After getting it off my chest, I, I really thought Donald, my small group leader, would tell me how sorry he was I lost my faith and, and tell me that maybe church just wasn't for me. Instead, he did the weirdest thing. He would laughed. I was really confused. And he began to tell me his story of faith and how he had gone to the same place too. His faith story had taken some of the same twists and turns. He also explained he had had a mentor that had helped him answer and chase every one of his doubts. And if I wanted, he would do the same for me. So over the next three years, Donald mentored me. And we began to chase my doubts one by one. We started with the very existence of God and moved on to the reliability and the validity of the Bible as a document and on to the historical soundness of the resurrection. We, we covered everything. And I got to the place where instead of seeing tendrils of doubt as fear, I'd look forward to them because I started to realize that it would, that it would, it would increase my faith map as I discovered new things about God. I didn't mind getting lost because God would be around the next corner with something new for me to discover. After a first year of college majoring in music theory and jazz, I enrolled at Judson University as a biblical studies major, where I spent the majority of my time using my newfound questioning skeptic nature to explore apologetics or systematic theology and heady philosophies. The thing I found over and over again as I dug for truth was that over time, after I followed each tendril of doubt, I would end up with a new belief, a new way of viewing God. And that if I dug hard enough from whatever direction the ultimate truth ended up being about, Jesus. For me, if Jesus was who he said he was, if God died, rose from the grave, then, then it changed everything. It's the pivotal hinge point of all theology, philosophy, and truth for me. I follow Jesus because I believe he is who he said he is. He is my way, my truth, and has become my life. Everything I do is rooted to him being the person he said he was. And every time I see another tendril of doubt appear, I'm no longer afraid like I once was. It didn't shake me. I look forward to a new vine attaching me to God. In the depths of northeastern India, in one of the wettest places on earth, bridges aren't built they're grown. Generations of the Warkahis tribe people spend years tending to the bridges, weaving living rubber tree roots in and around each other and cross the river to form these living bridges. These organic overpasses end up being so rooted 
so strong that even the heavy monsoon rains that flood the rivers aren't able to wash away the bridges. My life work as a pastor is to guide a community to be interconnected and growing together like a faith bridge for those chasing the ultimate truth. How cool would it be to be a part of a church that didn't, that didn't fake faith in any way, where no one pretended to have it together, where we could all pursue truth together honestly and openly. In Mark 9, the author tells a story of a dad who's desperate to have his son healed from an evil spirit that has been tormenting. The dad doesn't seem 100% sure who Jesus is, but in his distress, is willing to give this faith healer a shot. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into a fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help him. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. What I love about this story here is Jesus doesn't stop the healing because the father doesn't have some correct measure of faith. In fact, I think he performs two miracles at the same time. One, the healing of the boy. The second is the growing of that father's belief. How much more do you think that father accepted Jesus for who he said he was after that? I keep reaching points in my life where I think I'm the one that should have it all figured out. And I have to constantly relearn that I don't. And it's okay not to. That I will never have every doubt eliminated. That while I pursue God and truth, there is this element of faith. A choice. A choice to trust that God will continue to do what he has done for me for the last 25 years. Lead me to truth and himself. I feel like this is the essence of the character of Christ. So much of religion up until Jesus had been the kind of that pull yourself up by your own bootstraps style. But Jesus doesn't wait until we have life all figured out or believe enough. He helps those who seek him. And this, this is good news.